why you have come to church. Maybe it's tradition. Every Sunday evening, you've been in the habit of coming along to church. Maybe you've come this evening because you've been invited to come. Let me tell you now, it's no accident that you are here in the building this evening. And I I know talking to George on many occasions, people ask the question, well, how do you know the Lord is leading you to speak on something? Well, I got confirmations this morning very clearly in what Harvey spoke about. And as Rebecca has sung this evening, the last verse of that last piece, when I stand in glory, I will see his face, and there I'll serve my king forever. Hopefully as we read the scriptures this evening as as I speak, hopefully you will see all of these things beginning to tie in. And I believe the Lord has something to say to each one of us this evening. And I hope it comes with freshness. And ultimately I hope this evening that it comes with a reality maybe to a heart that has never yet made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. The world in which we live in is made up of many things. So often we can find that we end up with things that seem to be almost at the opposite ends of the spectrum. Contrasts. Light and dark is, I suppose, the most obvious contrast we have. During the, the, uh, the day, the light shines. Sometimes it can be a bit dull with the clouds, but ultimately the light's there. And then at night, the opposite comes in and the darkness. Hot and cold, good and bad, all of these things contrasting. And I want to uh, look this evening and to pick on just a few contrasts in Scripture and hope that we can look at them in such a way that it uh, enables you to um, understand maybe something with a fresh perspective. As we read through the Gospel accounts, we see many people coming into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he speaks and he preaches in a different way to suit the individuals that he's speaking to. Sometimes we read of him speaking to the disciples, just a small group of men that weren't terribly well educated. Other times we read of him on on the mount preaching maybe to four and five thousand people for for maybe a number of hours. Other times we see him very much on a one-to-one basis. We see him standing at the well talking to the woman from Samaria. We see the woman bought taken in adultery. And on so many occasions as we read through the Gospel accounts, we come across a phrase quite regularly about the scribes and the Pharisees being the religious people of the day that sometimes didn't want to be at the front listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. But they were normally there in the vicinity. You'll understand what I mean by that. They weren't pushing the way through to the front to be seen, to be listened, listening to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet so often we see situations where they're in the background. And I think sometimes on occasions when the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching, he's so aware of that, he will speak quite openly and almost in a confrontational way to prick the ears of the Pharisees. Commentators would go as far as to say of the Pharisees, they professed to trust God, but they measured life by wealth and possessions the same as the unbelieving crowd. I would go as far as to say that that is the world that we still live in. That so often people judge life by wealth. The things that people have, the things that people possess. And because I think of the, the technical, technological age that we live in, so many of our TV personalities and sports stars are almost seen as megastars very, very quickly. And so many of them are seriously wealthy as a result of this ability to be able to run around a football pitch and kick a ball or stand on a stage and and act. So you can imagine when the Lord Jesus Christ told the story that we're going to read this evening with the Pharisees somewhere in the background that they were quite shocked. I want you to turn with me, please, to a well-known passage in the Gospel of Luke and beginning to read at verse 19. And I want you to carry that thought with you as we read these verses. 
Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he did lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger into water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the, thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him into my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. The Pharisees would have heard this. Now, we've talked about the fact that the Pharisees were seen as people that measured wealth uh, by possessions. The, the logic of the day is very much that they, the, the Pharisees would have viewed the rich man as being somebody, because of his success, to ultimately have been blessed by God, that what he had was as a result of him living a righteous life. And I'm sure they would have been shocked when their perception of this rich man was they were confronted with the truth that the Lord Jesus Christ said that this man was in hell. I want to look at the cost, contrast, first of all, of three things. And then what I want to do at the end is to just draw from those three things which are quite factual, the application that we need to take this evening and to learn from. First off, we read of the rich man in verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Having read a little bit up about um, the, the time in which uh, this was written, the, the colour purple apparently was a very difficult colour to be able to dye. In the modern age in which we live, you can almost have anything at very low prices. And yet, this uh, purple and this fine linen, linen would lead us very quickly to realise that this man was um, of noble um, origin. Um, he, was, he was very, very well um, to do. Um, he would have worn, I suppose, what uh, in our day and age we would say he would have been wearing the Armani or the, the Dolce and Gabbana suits. The designer gear of the day would have been what this guy would have been dressed in. It said that he fared sumptuously. That, that meant that he ate extremely well. Now, I'm sure if he was eating extremely well, he would have maybe been a rather substantial gentleman. But the scripture doesn't tell us that. But this is a man that didn't just dine on special occasions. It wasn't something maybe three times a year, um, a birthday or a celebration. This was a regular thing for this man. He had the best chefs and he would have enjoyed the very best food. So these two simple descriptions lead us very quickly to realise that this was a man um, of a complete affluence and wealth beyond imagination. Uh, and I've used the, the name of Sir Alan Sugar maybe just to give us some indication of the sort of guy uh, that we were dealing with. If you watch that programme, The Dragon's Den, the five dragons are probably prime example of people that could live this type of lifestyle if they so wanted to. We're not told where his wealth comes from. 
it's very unlikely in the age that he was, he was living in that this just came from being very good at his job. He may well have been of noble uh, origin, we're not told. He may well have inherited it. He, he may have had a family that were huge landowners, we're not too sure. What we do know from reading through Scripture is so often people that were involved in, in tax collecting, these would have been people that got rich fairly quickly due to some of their dodgy dealing that we would read of. But nevertheless, it's not really too critical as how this man amassed his wealth. It's, it's more critical to, to realise what that wealth meant to him. It's very interesting to, from the words that we see, this man basically spent it all upon himself. He had the lavish lifestyle, the clothes, the great food... We read in another verse that Lazarus was laid at his gate. Now, I don't think this maybe would be the gate that we have at the bottom of our driveway, 20 metres from the house. I would say this guy had a, a fairly long weaving gate through the countryside uh, before you got to his residence. So we're dealing with somebody that was very much uh, a man of the moment um, and somebody that more than likely enjoyed the limelight and was sort of very well known in the vicinity. To all intents and purposes, if I was going to label this man, he was somebody that looked after number one as his major priority. He lived um, and wanted for absolutely nothing. But then when we read through 20 and 21, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table... Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. See the contrast? This wasn't a man that was dressed in fine clothes. This wasn't a man that enjoyed great food. It said that he longed to be filled. Even the crumbs that fell from the table were probably far more than this uh, man Lazarus ever got to enjoy. So we see them sitting in a different situation. He was somebody that was more than likely crippled and so often... In Scripture, we read, because there was no social security in those days, they didn't get an allowance from the local um, area that they lived. They relied on people maybe carrying them where they could beg and get something because they were unable to move to these places on their own steam. So this was a picture of Lazarus, quite a pathetic picture. A man suffering with um, lameness probably of the feet and maybe more, and the sores speak of, I'm sure, a very um, unclean um, home life and, and problems that come as a result of that. So we start off this evening with the first contrast being a contrast in life. Two men very much breathing the same air, but at opposite ends of the social spectrum. The contrast that we see in life. The second contrast that I want to draw your attention to is the contrast in death. We read verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Lazarus was the first of the two men to die. I suppose when we consider the illness and the, the physical condition, the lack of food that he was getting, it's probably not a surprise that Lazarus was the first man to die. But we read a lovely expression here that he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom may be a phrase that we're not familiar with. Uh, the commentator said that it's a, it's a symbolic expression of a place of, of bliss. Uh, the Old Testament patriarch Abraham would have been seen as the father of the Jewish nation. And I don't know what picture the... Um, the people of the day had, but a picture that you would rest at comfort and peace with Father Abraham would have been something that would have been immense at the times. Maybe not something that we can maybe uh, fully experience this evening, but it was something ultimately that would have given uh, the Jewish person at that time uh, great joy and, and something really to focus on and indeed to look forward to. It's a lovely picture here of the death of a believing saint. In Psalm 116, verse 15, we read these words. 
Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. The psalmist was able to record these lovely words in Psalm 23 that we know so well. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and staff, they comfort me. So we see quite clearly a picture here that this man that has had quite rather a pitiful life, when life comes to an end, all of a sudden we see something wonderful coming into play here. And it's the Abraham's, uh, sorry, it's the, the angels carrying this man Lazarus. Now I just want to simply explain what I believe uh, from having read um, around this subject what this, this situation is, what it is and what it, what it is not. We have to remember that as the, as the Lord Jesus Christ was telling this story, he was very much alive. Calvary was something, as we were told this morning, that was ahead of the Lord Jesus Christ. He knew that he would go one day to Calvary's cross, that he would see the tomb, that he would rise again. This had still to take place. And on that basis, I say quite reverently that heaven was closed for business at that stage. The Lord Jesus Christ had left heaven and had come down. So what we see here uh, is a picture of a, of a place of bliss and tranquility and comfort that's talked about. Even Jesus, as he hung upon the cross, said to, to the dying thief, if you remember those words, today... Thou shalt be with me in paradise. He didn't say that today that um, man on the cross would be in heaven with him. It took three days for the Lord Jesus Christ to go down into the earth, into, into that, that, that dead body, into that resurrection. And it was only when he conquered death that basically we read of the, um, the curtain in the temple being torn from top to bottom and basically, again reverently, that sign, heaven, now open for business. And we believe that at that stage the Lord Jesus Christ took all of those that had died with their faith in him to heaven above. So the picture of Abraham's bosom existed at that time because the Lord Jesus Christ hadn't been through the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. I hope, I hope I haven't mixed you up in any way, but it, it's important to realise. But then, as we go through into the New Testament, after the Lord Jesus Christ had indeed died, Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, the Corinthians had, I'm sure, um, tackled him on a number of occasions over their concerns and their worry of their loved ones that had died with their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul was able to tell them this recorded in 2 Corinthians. There's, there's eight verses. I'm not going to quote eight verses. But in chapter 5, if you're interested, we, we, realize, we read this. For we know that if our earthly house, that's the body of this tabernacle, were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And then verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. So the Lord Jesus Christ had risen back to heaven. Heaven was now open to receive anybody that would die with their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the confidence that Paul was giving those believers in Corinth, that, that their loved ones were now with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven above. As we moved on to the rich man, I wondered and I searched around and couldn't find a big lot of help in any of the comment commentaries. He's only called a rich man. There's no name actually recorded in Scripture for him. Lazarus is named. And I, and I believe what it is that when somebody becomes a Christian, when somebody puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we read in Revelation that their name is entered into the Lamb's Book of Life. And I would suggest and like to, to offer an explanation as to why the rich man has no name. It's because his name had never made it into the Lamb's Book of Life because the manner in which he lived 
and the manner in which he died. God knows each one of us, but it's when we're saved that our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ changes. We become children of God. Interesting to note in that verse that the rich man died and was buried. We don't read of, the, uh, of Lazarus being buried. He wouldn't have got the lavish funeral that the rich man would have had. No doubt he would have been given uh, a pauper's funeral, maybe just buried in a hole in a field with nobody there. But this rich man would have, I'm sure, had the same sort of funeral that really reflected the extravagant lifestyle that he, that he had. I wonder what was said at his funeral. I've often heard people say, um, and George mentioned it only a few weeks ago in a gospel service, that he went to a funeral once and, and the preacher stood up uh, and said so many nice things about the guy that had just been buried and George thought he was at the wrong funeral. That maybe is what would have happened here. Because this guy, as we've already read, lived for himself, the rich man. He lived a selfish life looking only out for himself, but I'm sure that wouldn't have been the way he would have been portrayed at his funeral. So these men lived differently and they died differently. And finally, the last contrast is the contrast in where these two characters are in eternity. They're as much in eternity this evening as they were one minute after they died. We don't know when they died. They, they died at some stage before the Lord Jesus Christ lived and walked upon this earth. Again, we don't read, read a huge amount about Lazarus. Verse 25 says that Lazarus is now comforted, a place of bliss and comfort. If we look into the book of Revelation and we start to look at the description of heaven, which is now open for every person that comes and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, heaven is a wonderful place, a place of no tears, a place of no suffering, a place of no pain, no more death. What a tremendous outlook this evening for anybody that's trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ to know that that is what awaits them when they enter into eternity. But we see quite a bit of detail on the rich man. He was assigned eternity in hell. We read in verse 23, and in hell he did lift up his eyes, being in torments. The dictionary defines torments as great mental suffering, unhappiness, and goes as far as to stress even great physical pain. Torment is one of those things that's very much in the mind. The older you get, the saying goes, the more forgetful you get. Well, I firmly believe that when we get to eternity, when somebody is in hell, that they will remember every single opportunity that they ever had in this scene of time. When somebody spoke to them, somebody that they worked with, somebody that they were at college with or school with, that told them of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they rejected it. I believe all of those things will be playing around in their mind for all of eternity. We're confronted with two things that are very clear from these verses. The soul is eternal. The physical body remains in Mother Earth but the soul is the part that upon death will move out into eternity. As much as heaven is a real place and a place of tremendous beauty when we read through the book of Revelation, hell is as real a place as heaven. It's a lonely place. It's a place where pain and suffering are very real. I remember at 16 years of age being confronted with the gospel. I think it's probably fair to say that my limited understanding of hell was that all the bad people were there having a riot of a time for all of eternity. How wrong I was at that age. Because we see this man tormented 
We see him alone. So those are the three contrasts that we see in life. I've tried to cover them from a relatively factual stance. All I simply want to do in the closing minutes now is to look at these and make the application that is so relevant for us this evening. First point, both men teach us very clearly that when life concludes on earth, eternity begins. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, so way back into the final day of creation, we read these words, and God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Now I look round this evening, there's nobody down there that looks like me and you should be grateful for that. So we don't possess God's physical likeness. So what did, what does this verse mean? Well I believe there are many, many aspects to it but I want to say that I believe that what we do possess is we, we possess an eternal soul the ability to live for all of eternity. Our, our passage shows two men in eternity. The body for these two men was in the ground at whatever point they were buried. And those bodies remain still in the ground today. But their souls moved on into eternity. The moment they breathed their last breath, the moment that heart stopped, these men moved into eternity and we read, we read, don't we, straight away and in hell he did lift up his eyes. His eyes opened straight away and that rich man realised where he was at. So there is a, an eternal sense, an eternal element that lives within each one of us. The second thing I think we've already established quite clearly as well is the reality of heaven and hell. Brother Harvey this morning brought that to the, the children, the reality of heaven and hell and the importance that we realise you can't have heaven without a realisation that hell exists. I want to point out one thing, that the rich man was not in hell because of his riches. And I want to make that very clear. As mentioned earlier, he seems to have been a man that lived solely to please himself his character seems to be driven by money and things. He seems not to have cared for anyone. I'm sure every time he weaved down his long driveway in his, in his uh, chariot or whatever he travelled in, the gates opened and there was this pitiful sight of a man, Lazarus, at the gate. He was aware of his needs and I'm sure... Not once did he ever think that he had a responsibility. The Old Testament teaching very much would say that people um, should have a responsibility to look after um, those individuals that are unable to look after themselves. These words are recorded in 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. It's the love of money. It's not the value of money, the amount of money. It's when you get to a stage where the love of money is such that that is what motivates you, that's what wakes you up in the morning, that's why you get up early and you head out to work, because it's that desire to make more money. And ultimately, if that desire exists, you want to make more money for yourself, to provide yourself with more, to provide more maybe for your family. Matthew, uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, we have... Words of the Lord Jesus Christ recorded from the Sermon on the, on the Mount. No one can serve two masters, for either you will hate the one and love the other, or else you will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or you cannot serve God and money. Again, the reality that if money is, is the main element in your life, then nothing else matters. That seems to be the way it goes. Now maybe this evening you think, oh, but the problem is, Glenn, all you're doing is quoting from the Bible and I, I don't believe the Bible. I don't think there's any relevance in the Bible. 
Well, listen to this. This was something that was only recorded um, maybe within the last two years. Listen to these words. I believe that with great wealth comes great responsibility. A responsibility to give back to society and a responsibility to see that those resources are put to work in the best possible way to help those most in need. So if you part the spiritual comments that I've made, this guy here is ultimately saying that he has realised that with great wealth, he doesn't feel he's got maybe a spiritual responsibility, but he just realises that he has sufficient and should seek to care for those about him. I don't think our rich man had that philosophy. Those words were made by Bill Gates, multi-billionaire founder of the Microsoft Corporation. So even with his riches and everything that he could possess because of that, there was a realisation. And I believe that within every one of us, God put something that he can build on. And I believe that that is an element to show that there is an element of caring that should exist within every one of us. What we have shouldn't be just for us. And I think that's the element, um, the downfall uh, of the rich man. The key here to understanding that your eternal resting place is secured and selected this evening. It's not a decision that you can take five minutes after you die. I don't like it down here. I want to move. Because we read um, those words, and beside all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Basically, when you open your eyes in eternity, where you find yourself is where you will stay for all of eternity. I want to simply close by saying this evening that God is not going to force anybody this evening in this building to accept his offer of mercy. He will honour the decision that you make in life. If you make a decision to live for yourself, then God will honour that. If you choose to do that, then you have to be willing to live with the consequences of that decision. The, the choice you have this evening is to accept the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In other words, if you want to see heaven, if you want to see the Father, you must come in simple repentance through the Lord Jesus Christ, realising that living the life that the rich man lived is taking you on a downward path. You have the opportunity this evening to pray a simple prayer. I will have booklets with me in the porch on the way out, and if you're interested in what we've been saying, please talk to us. Don't be like the rich man who decided to pray too late. We're going to conclude with the words...